And welcome from the Far Out Radio Room in southern New Jersey, in the Pines, way back in the Pines. Welcome to Far Out Radio with Scott and Karen Teeters. I'm Scott. Today is Tuesday, April the 2nd, 2013. Hope you had a nice day. Dr. PMH Atwater is back with us for part two of our conversation about our new book, Children of the Fifth World, published by Bear and Company. Dr. Atwater was on the program last week on March the 26th, and we covered the beginning chapters of the book. And you can catch Dr. Atwater's last visit in the archives at FarOutRadio.com. To get a sense of where we are headed, it helps to know where we have been. Dr. Atwater outlined the generational signatures from 1900 to present. Each group is very different with positive and negative characteristics that are often the root cause of the classic generation gap that's probably been going on for a long, long time. But one thing is certain, there's no going back. And while it would be a good thing to preserve the positive aspects of the previous generations, it is the youngest of today that will carry us forward. Dr. Atwater calls this latest generation the 9-11 generation. They have unprecedented opportunities and unique challenges, the likes of which we're trying our best to understand, and that's why Dr. Atwater is back with us tonight. Dr. PMH Atwater, are you there? Welcome back to the program. You bet I'm here, (laughs) and I'm glad to be back. (laughs) Indeed. The doctor's in, and we're going to expand our mind, folks. How are you? Well, I'll tell you, this is the first time we haven't had snow. So as nice? far as I'm concerned, it, it's <laughs> celebration time. I look out my window and there's no snow. No snow, that means it's a good week, huh? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we had a similar experience of that about four or five years, here in, uh, four or five years ago here in New Jersey, so I, I know of what you speak. Yeah, uh, well, uh, we got... you know, every time you turn around, it's snowing again. Uh, but yeah, let's get I, back to I, the I... topic. I remember that well. Our new kids. We had some interesting feedback from your last visit, and while we're going to stay focused on the bigger picture, I want to briefly share an overall notion with some of our listeners. If you're having a tough time, it's likely because we're in very tough times. And probably it's not personally you that's the problem, but it may well indeed be personally hitting you. Never give up. Every day that you wake up, you have another chance. The great home run baseball slugger Babe Ruth was once in a slump, and a reporter asked him if he was worried, and he said, Why should I worry? Let the pitchers worry when I start hitting again. I just keep swinging at them. So if you're in a slump, if you're in a rut, keep your wits. Stay in your creative zone and spend some more time digging in that gold mine between your ears and keep swinging at them like the Babe did. Most likely, it's not going to be easy. As you can glide along in a rut, you know, but if things get a little bumpy, it just means you're working your way out of the rut, that's all. So never quit and never say die. Okay, Doctor, the 9-11 generation is our future, and the oldest of them, I was thinking about this today, the oldest of them is going into junior high school very soon and with another six years of education ahead of them. And unfortunately, They are bearing the full brunt of the failed No Child Left Behind program. So let's start with education and where we are now, and what can we best do to help these unique little ones? Well, you know, a lot of teachers, um, they're trying, of course, a lot of different things. Uh, Among the things that they they are are trying um, are things like what John, John Hunter did here in Charlottesville, Virginia. He's a fourth grade teacher. He invented the World Peace Game. It's a huge, standalone, four tiered plexiglass tower that, that stands in the middle of the classroom. And it consists of countries and dramas and weather developments and mercenaries and temples and on and on and on. Um, and it, you know, it completely dominates the classroom. The kids have to divide up into teams. They're given a global problem that they must solve. They have to take into consideration all aspects of each action they take. They must learn to collaborate within their team. They have to think critically, examine all possible solutions, compete for answers, and do the research outside the box uh, to solve it. And it's 
these kinds of act, actuality, in other words, um, it's, it's not in an iPad, it's not on a Kindle, it's not on mm-hmm. a computer. You walk into the classroom and here is a real, for real, very daunting and fascinating game that's many stories tall. And you have to play that game in a team. So you have to think, collaborate, work together, and and work out all the different problems and things that could occur. Um, you know, find the solution. It's things like this, taking philosophy into the classroom. Yes, even in the third grade. You know, these kids, they're um, they're really affected by all of the killings, all of the drama, all of the drugs, all of the families, all that they see on TV, and they want to talk about it, and they want to talk about it with each other, and that you really need a teacher there or a mentor there, and really start with uh, philosophy clubs, um, philosophy in the school itself. Um, it, it, it's fabulous. Start from the, the third grade on. You need class courts. These kids know what to do when things go wrong. So the, so the teacher's there as a mentor. You have the class court. Something has happened. The kid who, 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 who you know, had the problem, they have to appear before the court. They have to um, spell out what happened. The court decides punishment. And and they they do the follow through, and and you know kids are more fair yet more explicit, and um, than any adult, and and if you have these class courts, it, it, it's fabulous, and and another th- another thing that schools are having incredible success with now is meditation. And, and don't laugh when I say that. I'm talking 15 minutes in the morning, 15 minutes in the afternoon of silence. I mean, you stop the class, 15 minutes of silence. They can drink. Used to call that taking a nap. Yeah. Well, no, no. They, <laughs> they, they, you know, they can sit there. They can twiddle. They can, you know, meditate. They can think. They can do uh, whatever. Uh, but they have to do it in total silence. And hmm. these schools that are doing this, 15 minutes in the morning, 15 minutes in the afternoon, are turning around the entire grade. The people, the kids, they're getting better scores. They're doing better at school. Um, the, even the teacher um, is more relaxed. And... It, um, the scores are, are just way up there. The, the kids want to go to school. They learn more. Just doing that, Scott, that's all they're doing. 15 minutes of silence in the morning, 15 minutes of silence in the afternoon. And it's making all the difference in school. Um, that, you that's get a, a flat out the, golden. That's yeah. a great thing just to do all your life. <laughs> <laughs> Isn't it incredible? Yeah. You know, the, the kinds of things we did as a kid, children are not doing today. Um, the number one uh, a fear of most kids today is silence. They don't know what silence is. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So if you give them an opportunity to, um, you know, to experience real silence, it, it it begins to change their brain, their behavior, their emotions. They settle it down. They get more alert. Uh, it's fabulous. And there's, it, there's all kinds of simple things like this in the book. Name, address, phone mm-hmm. number, email, website. You know, I, I give as many uh, resources as I possibly can. And if you're in a particular school, uh, you know, lucky if you are, that teaches full immersion language. Whoa, is that ever effective? 
That the cha- your chapter on education, it's called uh, Education Rocks, uh, is just loaded with information there, and we could do a whole program just on that. But we're going to move on to another topic on the other side of the break, and we're going to let the shadows take us out with their lovely rendition of Stardust. And we invite all of our listeners to check out our growing collection of archive programs. You can listen to the last time Dr. Atwater was on the program. Just go to the Topics of Shows heading at the top of faroutradio.com and uh, have a look, see, and find what you like. We call it uh, talk radio on your terms. That's why we call it smart talk radio. And we'll be right back. And welcome back to Far Out Radio, and that was Apache by The Ventures. Our guest tonight is author and researcher Dr. P.M.H. Atwater, and we're talking about her insightful new book, Children of the Fifth World, A Guide to the Coming Changes in Human Consciousness, published by Barron Company. This is a roadmap for the future, folks, and we invite you to stop by P.M.H. Atwater's website. It's pmhatwater.hypermart.net. That's pmhatwater.hypermart.net hypermart.net and you can get all of her books and dvds right there and if you like what you're hearing this evening children of the fifth world is available as a kindle book so you can get yours right after the program dr atwater i especially like chapter 15 food health and the environment tell us what happens to children in schools when they get rid of the uh, uh the funny food and the fake food and the uh, uh and the fake drinks well, they, they're going to settle down. They're going to settle down and get more alert and do their work better. Uh, they're going to be smarter. You know, uh, the so-called fake foods or processed foods or um, uh, over-sugared foods uh, mm-hmm. make, a, make a tremendous difference on the health and the mind, uh, the brain, of, of of our children, ourselves, you and me, it makes a big difference with everybody. Um, you, yeah. you just said a key word, it makes a big difference with everybody. I, I heard several years ago that, I don't remember where this happened, but it was a, a prison somewhere here in the United States, and the, the warden was a vegan. And the warden said, I'm changing the, uh, the cafeteria uh, menu. It's all vegan now. No more coffee, all vegan food. And everybody, after a, a month or so, completely settled down. Yeah, yeah, it makes what a difference. A, what a geez, like, huh, you think they might be onto something there? Well, even if you do eat meat, you don't eat that much of it. You cook it differently. Mm-hmm. Um, right. But you know, the, the main emphasis is on veggies, and certainly a little bit of fruit. You don't want to overdo on fruit because you know that's sugar. So a little bit of it's good. Uh, but your vegetables, wow. Yeah, veggies so, are your friend. Yeah, they are. Veggies are your friend. You know, these, mm-hmm. these new kids are, are so smart. They are literally us. They are the human race. This is what we are becoming is, is this new pattern, this new model of the human being. So I, I don't want your audience to think that the, that the book is just about kids. It's about the human race and how we are changing. You know, a lot of pe- people talk about indigo kids and crystal kids and starseed and cosmic and psychic and all this kind of stuff. And I'm saying, uh, no, Let, let's, let's not label this with these kinds of labels because they really don't fit. They're exaggerated and confusing. Let's admit right. here that the, that the genetics of the human race, our DNA, our gene pool, is altering and changing globally, worldwide, everywhere. Um, and, and among the things that's happening, there are really two gene mutations that create a better brain. And, and we're, what we're ha- what's happening now in, in, in the world, at least what scientists are telling us, is about one-third of, of, of the people across the world are getting both of those um, gene mutations uh, together. Um, and, and most of the rest of the world is getting at least one of them. So we've got a, a, 
about one third that are getting both of them. And what I'm seeing, when I look around, when I'm looking at, for instance, your, your standard IQ test, uh, about one third of those countries where they um, actually uh, have, have the testing done, uh, the kids are, are testing out between 150 to 160. That's way beyond uh, the score for genius. Uh, right. Many of them are testing out into the 200. You know, we, we've got this 15-year-old kid. You know, you 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 probably already know about this, who wanted to come up with a reliable test, a cheap, reliable test, uh, to alert people to early stage pancreatic cancer. He's a 15-year-old kid. <laughs> So he applies. Fifteen is thinking and, about pancreatic cancer. Yeah. Well, <laughs> wow. he had a friend that died of it. That's why. Okay. So he applies at 200 laboratories. Only one accepted him and let him come in and do his testing in a laboratory. He hmm. did it. He came up with the best, cheapest, easiest, early stage test for pancreatic cancer. And, and 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 this is just you know this is just one example. These kids are incredible. Um, they're creative. They're inventive. They're coming up with new ideas. Um, and, and they're they're kind of um, what should I say? Kind of scruffy in that they're not taking the old stuff. They're they're, they're not applying um, as well to various rules and regulations and what big bosses and big governments and, and big leaders are saying, they're coming out and saying, wait a minute here, you know, this, this, this doesn't fit, or I can't see this, or this isn't working, uh, I want something different, or I, or I believe I can do something different. And, and, and the real puzzle we're having as a society is here are these kids, about 64% of them, do not have, um, well, about 64% of them have a high school diploma, but yet 80% of all the jobs require a diploma beyond high school. Mm. So this is getting a lot of the kids. And, and it's getting a lot of them because they feel they already know this. Why should they go to college? Why should they... Um, even even high school. Why should they do this? They already know this. Like this 15-year-old kid. You know, wow. why should he have a Ph.D.? He could do it at the age of 15. Uh, tough questions. It reminds me of the story of uh, Dr. Pat Flanagan when he was 15 years old. Yeah. He invented a, the nuclear uh, bomb detector and made it for about $10. And, of course, the, the Air Force took it and they didn't give it back to him. But anyway... <laughs> There's our music. It's time for a break. And if you'd like to sign up for our daily email notifications, Top of Far Out Radio, look for the Keep Up to Date with this box. You'll be there. If you're listening to Far Out Radio, we'll be right back. And hey, welcome back to Far Out Radio. And that was Len Miller's classic toe tapper, In the Mood. Our guest tonight is author and researcher, Dr. PMH Atwater. We're talking about her guidebook for the future, Children of the Fifth World, published by Bear and Company. This is an outstanding analysis of where we've been and where we are headed. And we invite you to stop by PMH Atwater's website. It's pmhatwater.hypermart.net. And all of her books and CDs are there. And Children of the Fifth World is available as a Kindle book, so you can get yours right after the program. Let's talk about community, and I was quite struck by um, the first two paragraphs on page 38, because you, you mentioned the, uh, the Shanghai student test scores story, and it, which a lot of people in the West just go, oh, man, we're, we're so losing it. But there's a dark side to that. Where are you in the book? I'm on one, page 138 in oh. the chapter called Community. These kids, um, um, their support system, their teachers, their parents, uh, 
the com- the community the community in which they find themselves are so dedicated to helping these kids get through and to learn 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 uh, and to excel that that they get the highest scores in the world you know it's incredible what they're able to do they're absolute whiz kids but they lack creative vision all all of the emphasis is on learning, learning, getting these high scores, um, you know, understanding the data in the sense of being able to put things together and, you know, come up with the right answer. But there's nothing creating. There's mm-hmm. no visionary. They don't have Steve Jobs over there. You know, the, the, right. you know, the Steve Jobs that we had here, the, the creative inventor. They don't have creative vision. And that's what they're missing. Um Two two things jumped out at me when I read that section. One of them was the the very popular attention that's been paid to Chinese tiger moms, these these drill sergeant, oftentimes beautiful, exotic looking Chinese moms who are like drill sergeants. They're horrors, you know. But boy, their kids get great grades. And I and I see these stories, like I think, well, what are these kids going to turn out like? And and the other thing that that jumped out at me was when I was in the toy industry. Um, we send everything over to China to get to get manufactured, and it, they are notoriously known as the knockoff kings. If they get a hold of anything, they can replicate yeah. it perfectly, and then it's gone. It's theirs. So, you know, if you send over a new design for a toy or whatever, poof, it's gone. You know, and uh, there have been a couple times where some pretty important military planes have crashed ar- around there, and they got their hands on that, so... But I'm sure they didn't copy any of that stuff either. But, uh, yeah, it's a strange mix, isn't it? I mean, we're, we're unruly here. We're undisciplined. But we have these, these uh, out-of-the-box thinker types that yeah. just so they, you know, they, they, drive us nuts. creative inventors. You betcha. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you know, when I was a kid, we had these beautiful, beautiful dishes. I mean fancy, exp- uh, expensive dishes. And the prettiest ones were always recreated by the Chinese or sometimes the Japanese, but usually by the Chinese. Mm-hmm. They could recreate everything. We would invent it over here, or they would in France, or they would in Europe, but it was the Chinese who could, well, well you know, they mimic it, but they would mass produce it, and so mm-hmm. you know they could they could turn it out quicker and cheaper than we could, and uh, you know it, it used to just really fascinate me and puzzle me as a child that that here's the fancy, I mean you know wonderful dishes and uh, that would be coming out of Europe that you'd pay an arm and a leg for. And mm-hmm. and yet you could get the same thing from China for a penny, and I mean Just, literally no. the same thing. Mm-hmm. I I don't mean an El Cheapo model. I mean literally the same thing, and, yeah. and you know overnight. But what we're seeing in the new kids, these these newer generations, the millennials, and now the nine one ones, and I think eventually the Aquarians that are coming in. These kids are so creative and so inventive that already it is not only amazing us, but it's shocking us. And, and, well, and speaking of shocking. You know, and they're entrepreneurs. Speaking of shocking, tell us about the rowdy kittens people <laughs> in their house <laughs> and the kind of life and community that they created for themselves. The rowdy kittens people. Yeah, the, that's the, they're oh gosh, I forget which page they're on in, in your book. It's this young young couple in their twenties. The young couple in their twenties, and they they've got this it really cute itsy bitsy little house, and you know they just oh, they just got yeah. fed up with living on the rat. They got tired of you know running the rat race because they realized that well even if you win yeah. you're still a rat. Well, you know, have you have you have you been on their website? Have you seen their house? Yes, yes, I have. <laughs> it's uh, a little <laughs> it's too small really for easy. us, but you know, um, this couple, this married couple, decided um, that they were going to enjoy life more, 
And the best way to do that was to downsize. Uh, they both had jobs, both had Seriously good jobs. Downsize. But they didn't mm-hmm. want to spend their money on rent, on, on things, on cars. They wanted to spend their money on doing what they wanted to do. They liked to travel. They liked parties. They liked their friends. They liked to get together and, you know, do stuff like that. So they got rid of everything. Uh, I mean, almost everything. And, and, and built these teeny weeny little houses. I mean, they're really teeny. <laughs> and, and they're, and they're perfectly comfortable in their, in their little house. And they mm-hmm. spend their money to uh, get these little snap cars, smart cars, whatever they're called, where you call a, a certain place and, and you're going you're gonna to rent the car and yeah. you use your plastic and you get it for a couple of hours or maybe a day or two. Uh, so that's how they get around. They get these little cars or, or they ride, you know, public systems. And, and then... They spend the rest of their money going to concerts, taking trips, traveling, being with people, and they are so happy. They don't have a television set. They don't want one. They're not interested in DVDs or CDs. They want people. They want community. They want a life, and they're really and they're happy. Of, and they're living a very full life. It reminds me of, of uh, Dean and Jill Henderson. Uh, a lovely couple that are in their 40s, but they they got a, they got onto that uh, way of thinking uh, quite some time ago, and they live very very simply. Uh, they have a lovely house in the Ozarks, and uh, they are they are some of the only truly free Americans that I know of. Free in the sense that uh, they don't their, their overhead is so low they choose to work on and do what they they want to do, and they're they're quite amazing people. Good models actually. Uh, let's go to let's uh, slide into a break here and. Uh, we want to remind all of our listeners to stop by 4Out Radio, check out our archives. You can catch Dr. Atwater's last visit with us. You can join him anytime you like. We'll be right back. And welcome back to 4Out Radio. Dr. P.M.H. Atwater is back with us tonight. We're talking about her insightful new book, Children of the Fifth World, published by Bear and Company. This is a brilliant analysis of where we've been and where we are headed. And stop by Dr. Atwater's website. It's pmhatwater.hypermarked.net. And all of her books and CDs are there. And the book we're talking about this evening, Children of the Fifth World, is available as a Kindle book, so you can get yours right after the program. This book is so loaded with with just juicy things that you could talk about for I hours know. and hours I, and we can't you possibly You caught me on that everything. one, you know, because, <laughs> I, you know, I forgot that one until you gave me a well, hint. Well, I, I, look, <laughs> I looked that up this afternoon and I went, far out, man. <laughs> well, I want to live, but that's pretty cool as long as they're happy. You know, and they look to be in their, I don't know, mid to late 20s or so, but yeah, well, anyway. They might be in their 30s by now. Yeah, they're fascinating in couple. The, in your... In your chapter on community, there were a couple of things that jumped out at me. Uh, one of them was on page uh, 164. You mentioned something called ants. These, these are the white-collar workers in China that uh, can't find a place, to, a decent place to uh, work or live in their China's newest underclass. Yeah. China's men and women are becoming really uh, more, more, str- more brilliant, cocky, and forerunners of a major social problem in 15 to 20 years. And I couldn't help but wonder... Are, are we going to have ants here too? Highly educated uh, people, Americans who just can't find a decent job because it seems like there's this goofy meme out there that says, "Well, we should get rid of the minimum wage." You know, everybody should work for less and pay more for everything. I mean, we're all going to turn into well, ants. Well, we're, we're getting some of that with street, street yeah. people and and kids who can't leave home um, because where would they live? You know, uh, right. they don't have that kind of a job. But you know, this is this is this is really an interesting conundrum. In that, um, there's lots of jobs out there, but most of the jobs are for skilled labor with metals, manufacturing, and hands-on kind of work, where most of our kids are being educated for for more intelligent, um, 
you know, kind of thinking it through kind of work rather than no, hands-on we work. We were only recently being told that, well, hey, listen, we're, we, we're letting go of the industrial age. It's the information yeah, well, it's age coming now. Let back, the grandfather go. And that's where yeah. the jobs are, and they're good jobs. They're high-paying jobs. Yeah, and they don't have the people sink. to um, fill them. Fix the sink. <laughs> yeah. The toilet doesn't flush. <laughs> <laughs> or work with tool and dies, you know? Yeah. Uh, and that's where the big jobs are now. Uh, but, mm. you know, when I look at what's happening here, when I take that bigger, bigger picture, and, and I'm looking at the various pluses and minuses and all the different things, I'm really caught by the fact but there's so many thirds, you know, about one-third of them worldwide are geniuses, you know, high scores. Another third are unusually creative or psychic or intuitive. Uh, they're kind of quirky kids, but wow, can they come up with stuff. And another third are about amoral or headed toward more violent kinds of things. And, and I'm looking at the thirds, and I'm also looking at, okay, with our so-called learning disorders, about two-thirds of those with autism are male, about one-third are female, and, and it's the reverse with dyslexia. About two-thirds are female. Uh, you, you've got about one-third that have no sense of living a full life. They don't expect to, to live long. You've got about two-thirds that have no intention of ever marrying, going to college, becoming parents. Uh, and when I'm looking at all the stats, hmm. even for the last decade, I've been noticing that most of your downturns and uplifts are happening in thirds. And I keep looking looking at that and I'm saying, okay, wait a minute here, uh, third, third, third. This is sacred geometry. This is good old-fashioned sacred geometry. When you're dealing with thirds, that is the baseline of universal order. It's almost as if everything is happening on time at a certain rhythm according to a grander plan or a greater plan. It's almost as if there's another hand at work here because it's so consistent. And and I feel we have to look at that. I feel we have to sort of back up here and say there's something else going on here. And when we look at all the different predictions of a new race and new people and how we're changing and where we might be headed, then, then we're, we're looking at um, the kind of markers and the kind of models that, that these kids fill. And, and it's almost as if maybe thousands of years ago they were predicting this type of advance or change in the human family that is that is actually not right now occurring. And so I'm looking at this and I'm, and I'm saying to myself, this is where the human race is, is going. I mean, you can see it. This is where we're headed. This is us. This is you and me. This is us. This is our children. This is our grandchildren. Maybe who we are next time around if you believe in reincarnation. This is that next lift that has been predicted for eons of time, we're in that place now. And, and you know, the, the evidence for that, at least for me, is overwhelming. Hmm. Tell us about the third way. We've got about three minutes. <laughs> it goes by fast. <laughs> Oh, you're really nice, aren't you? Um, <laughs> the third way. Well, you know, um, I I, I want to be specific, so I'm trying to turn to that place in the book, and I'm not finding it right off the bat. Um, it's uh, page 218. Yeah, 
Oh, <laughs> thank you <laughs> for doing that. You know, when you think in terms of the third way, way one, we, we, we play, you know, when we're faced with life issues, we tend to react in one of three ways. All of us do. Either we're going to play ostrich and pretend that we don't see it, or we're going to label it an enemy or a devil, and we're going to attack it, you know, like what's happening now in Korea. Or we're going to confront this situation squarely and honestly, and we're going to search for the truth behind appearances, and we're going to take decisive steps to initiate constructive solutions. And this is what the kids uh, are doing. This is, this is called the creation of Holon, H-O-L-O-N. When you create Holon, you don't try to convert anybody to your way of doing things. You, 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 uh, you come up with uh, and face all the different parties, and you lay out what needs to be done, and, and you ask for their help. Would you do Because it's going to benefit all of us. Would you come forward and help out, make this, do this, and um, and and people work together because it's of mutual benefit. And what they're finding is that by not trying to change anybody, but rather by collaborating and working together as a team, then, wow, people start getting along. They start understanding each other. They start realizing, oh, you know, we don't have to be enemies. We can get along. We can get together. Mm -hmm. I saw mm -hmm. proof of this when I was in Istanbul in Turkey a few years ago. And 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 looking at that, that you know, the, the straits there and, and talking with... Um, some of the key government officials, and and found that you know because of all the shipments um, of oil and all this stuff coming down from Russia, um, the water is getting you know worse and worse and worse. Uh, in, in fact, the water is literally dangerous. Yeah, it's bad there. And 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 the guy um, said, "Okay, let's get together." This head politician said, okay, let's get it, get together. Let's solve this as a team, as a group. Let This is our water. Let's do it together. And, and so all of the Muslims, all of the Christians, all of the Buddhists and the Jews and the Wiccas, and everybody got together and, and fought it out, way. and it worked. They and it worked. Up they the they cleaned line. up that water. There, there is our music. It zooms by fast. It zooms by fast. Oh, uh, fast. We're going to have you back on. We're going to have you back on again next week to uh, talk about one of your other amazing books, folks. This book that we we're talking about this evening, uh, "Children of the Fifth World," is just loaded with with just nuggets of uh, real, real, true wisdom, and it's a, it's been a terrific read. You're always a pleasure to talk to, you, Doctor. I'm looking forward to having <laughs> you back on next week. Well, you're fun and too, Scott. Love. <laughs> oh, thanks. And that, la and that laugh, too. Thanks a lot. I appreciate it. Tomorrow night, our nutritionist, health food, health food store owner friend, and Bigfoot researcher, Eric Spinner, will be back on the program. He's going to share with us some of his experience and information about how to stay healthy and well as we transition from winter into the spring. Have a great evening. We'll be back tomorrow night with more Far Out Radio.